welcome to another session of uh, Data Talks Club podcast. Well, it's a bit unusual today. Well, Alexei is here. I'm here. But in, instead of Alexei hosting the podcast this time, I'm going to be hosting it and I'm going to be grilling him with questions. So a bit about Alexei and I, we've known each other for about, I don't know, how long has it been, Alexei? A year or two? Yeah, like something between that. Yeah, I think we met a long time ago, I can't remember how, uh, but we started chatting. And since then, we've been chatting every other month. Um, and through that, I think I've seen how Alexei has come to me with the crazy idea of wanting to start his community. Uh, I thought it was crazy, and now it's like, oh, that's a lot of work. And I've seen him really grown into the, the crazy, the amazing community is today. And I've always had a lot of questions for him. So today, I'm going to be taking my chance. Uh, but first, let us try to learn more about Alexei, the person, the person he is at work. Um, so Alexei, in 2010, you graduated with a degree in information technology and became a software engineer, mostly focused on Java. So fast forward more than 10 years later, you're now a principal data scientist at OLX. How did that happen? Yeah, so that's a long story, so I don't know how I can compress uh, 10 years into I'll try to be short because actually Eugene interviewed me um, half a year ago or something like that. So there is a long article that you also published on Towards Data Science, right? So if you want to have to know a longer version of that, you can go check the article. Um, but yeah, so my background, uh, yeah, Java development, and then I was doing that for a couple of years. And uh, then uh, one day I came across this website that is called Coursera. Maybe some of you heard about this. And on this website, there was a course called machine learning. And then I watched that course. It was by Andrew Eng from Stanford. And then I really loved it. And then I thought, okay, I think I'm wasting my time doing this Java stuff. I should do something else. I should actually use uh, some of the math skills I picked up at university in, uh, and do this, do this kind of stuff. So then I started doing more courses and uh, then I thought, then I started interviewing with companies and then they said, yeah, you know, you don't have uh, enough experience, enough education. So then what I did is I joined uh, a master's and then at the same time I started freelancing. And then with freelancing, uh, it was actually very easy to start freelancing. I was surprised um, by that. And then uh, fast forward two years, I got a portfolio, good portfolio with my freelance projects, with my um, master's degree, master's uh, diploma thesis. And that was enough to get a job. And then since then I'm doing uh, data science full time. Mm. Yeah, engineering, in my engineering background was very helpful in getting my first job as a data scientist. And then at the second company uh, I, where I worked, I focused more on actually engineering things, on setting up the infrastructure, doing, taking care of all these data pipelines and all that. Um, because there was nobody else who wanted to do that. And I thought, okay, maybe that would be me who takes care of that. And it worked out really well because back then, and I think this is still true today, companies really value this kind of experience. So a lot of people who took the courses, they know how to train a model in a Jupyter notebook. But what's after that? Like, how can you deploy these things? And or how do you like before that? How do you can you work on data pipelines? And then having this experience uh, that I got at the start and really helped me in basically every every place, every place where I interviewed, everyone was interested in that. Um, yeah. And uh, so this experience as a startup doing a bit of everything was also very helpful uh, in corporate environment. So OLX now where I work is more like a corporation than a startup. I've been with OLX for more than three years. So I joined as a senior data scientist. And yeah, I think I was doing a pretty good job because I got promoted two times there. Um, so my manager noticed. Uh, so I have a very good manager who noticed that uh, all my effort and uh, I got a few promos. And yeah, I guess that's it condensed, uh, like 10 years uh, of experience condensed into a couple of minutes. Nice. Thank you for sharing us, sharing that with us. I mean, do you have any lessons from, from, from your experience so far? What have you got so, got so far? Yeah, maybe not lessons is, uh, 
maybe advice is to try to you don't have to stay um, within your comfort zone right so try to step outside of your responsibilities so this is what i did with uh, what we said in data pipelines and uh, whatnot and that really helped so this opened um, the door to many many opportunities so i think that's one thing and then another thing is uh, it's very similar so it's not only about technology it's not only about engineering so also try to get into product uh, development try to understand uh, try to learn from your product manager because they are there for a reason right so they are making sure that uh, we as a team are working on the right thing so try to learn from them so i did these two things um, and that was quite helpful in my career so maybe that and one another lesson that may be something that i learned the hard way is don't chase the exciting things like if there is a neural network that uh, can do amazing things it doesn't mean that you need uh, that network for your business problem probably like uh, a couple of these statements will be enough or a logistic regression or something like that cool um so thank you for that alexi so i think one other question um so you know you shared with us about all the technical stuff at, uh, that you did uh, early in your career but now that you're a principal data scientist now that you're somewhat more senior can you share a bit about what do you do uh, in your work? I guess this, this is a question for people out there who are thinking, you know, what do actually senior data scientists do or principal data scientists, what do they do? Yeah, so uh, you can think of me as uh, an internal consultant. So we have a lot of teams at Toilix who work on different things. So we have a team that works on moderation, we have a team that works on search and recommendation, we have a team that works on uh, um, like other things. So we have like six teams or something like this. And uh, I'm like a consultant to this team. So I don't belong to any particular team, but more like if somebody needs help with something, I come there and help. Usually this is about, uh, you know, let's say somebody comes up with a model and now they want to find out what's the best may way of deploying this model. Or before that, uh, uh, like before even we start working, on a project. Uh, sometimes product managers reach out to me saying, hey, can you help us figure out if uh, machine learning actually is needed here? Or how would you go about using machine learning here? What kind of data we need? So I'm doing a lot of uh, consultancy, sort of, and then also coordinating and alignment because uh, I don't belong to any particular team. I can see what other teams are working on. I, can I, I know what kind of projects they work on. And when a new project starts, I can say, oh, wait a minute, this looks similar to what the other team did one year ago. Go talk to them. So I need to do this kind of thing uh, quite often, uh, saying, hey, talk to this team or talk to that team. Um, and then also maybe last bit is um, like taking part in architectural discussions or making technical decisions that affect many teams like uh, uh, how do we standardize the way we are doing data science? Like, well, even things like what kind of package manager we use so it's uniform across all the teams. So, yeah, and also maybe one last aspect is mentoring and education. Um, like I'm doing courses. For example, one of the last courses I uh, did was machine learning for product managers to tell them uh, why we need machine learning, what is possible to do with machine learning. And things like that and then also mentoring people like let's say we have an analyst who wants to become a data scientist what do they need to do to make the transition or there is a data engineer who wants to become a machine learning engineer or sometimes uh, a couple of years ago we had this discussion um, like who is a data, who is a machine learning engineer what kind of responsibilities they have and then sitting there with other teams and then defining these responsibilities that's also something I uh, I do Oh, that's very high leverage work. I mean, getting teams to talk to each other to make sure that they don't reinvent the wheel, uh, removing unnecessary work, and also educating people uh, and, you know, creating courses. And I can sort of see where the motivation comes to start Data Talks Club. So I remember more than a year ago, at the end of 2020, I think Alex mentioned this idea of building a community. And it turned out to be 20 Talks Club. And now Data Talks Club, I think now we have almost 9,000 or is it 10,000 already? It's almost so, 10. Yeah, almost 10. Yeah. 
So that's pretty crazy. Can you take us back to the very beginning? What what gave you this idea? Yeah, so when I start, even before I started my career, even before I had my first computer, communities were already like a part of my life. So I was interested in programming. Um, and then, yeah, actually I did have a computer, but I didn't have internet. So I was, uh, I became interested in programming. I had Delphi, Borla Delphi. This is like a programming language, which is based on Pascal. And yeah, I needed to do some stuff there, but without internet, it's very difficult. Uh, the help, uh, you know, when you press F1, there's this help thing. It wasn't super helpful and it also was in English and I didn't speak English that well back then. So I had to rely on others to help me with uh, that. And for me, it was a community. So I found uh, forums, online forums, where developers who like Delphi, when, when they were, where they were hanging out. And I had to, to go actually to go to my mom's place or my father's place uh, to access the internet. So I would go there and then ask for advice. And then sometimes at, uh, after a couple of months, like after half a year, I would also jump in and answer questions. So that was great. So when I was at university, when I already have had access to internet, I was a part of many different online communities, not only uh, development related, but also like some hobbies. Uh, I was into bootleg music. So this is like when you go to a concert, like a metal band concert, and you film the concert, and then you exchange with other enthusiasts. Uh, yeah, so that was, uh, so I, I was really into these online communities. And then I became a Java developer. Uh, the first thing I did, I registered at Java Talks, which was a online community for people who are Java developers. And this is actually where the name comes from, for, from, for a Data Talks club. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I, I was in, uh, inspired by that name. And I just started answering questions there in that community. And then after a couple of months, people thought that I'm super experienced person who knows everything. I wasn't, I was a junior. I had no clue what I was talking about, but in people's mind, uh, minds, I was, uh, you know, somebody who knows an answer to everything. And that was uh, a really nice experience. So, and then the same story happened when I decided to come to, to switch from Java development to data science. I joined a couple of online communities and I started I tried answering questions there. And that helped also to get, uh, you know, to know things, to see what doesn't work for people, where they get stuck, what they need help with, and then doing some research and then putting an answer um, there. Um, and yeah, so for me, communities were a big part of my life. And then at some point I was, uh, like in 2020, I was quite active on LinkedIn. I was, I would do a post every day um, with, you know, different career advice uh, like Daliana is doing right now. Um, so I was doing that sort of thing and um, I was getting a lot of questions in uh, uh, direct messages in LinkedIn where people would say, hey, I have this situation, can you help me? Or I have that situation, can you help me? Um, I was also doing some career consultation. So I would have like a, a 30 minutes Zoom call with people also, they would uh, ask me different questions. Um, funny thing is, sometimes people would come to me and say, hey, I am a QA engineer. How do I switch to, let's say, product management? I have no idea, right? I am not wow. a QA engineer. I don't know anything about product management. But the funny thing uh, is that I was able to actually help them by just listening and uh, asking, hey, but what do you like more? <laughs> and then uh, so people would just talk and then, you know, this rubber duck thing. Uh, yep. You just need to talk to somebody to to make a decision. And then, yeah, so I was doing that for a mm, couple of months. And then I thought, okay, it would be nice to first, uh, all these uh, direct messages I get from LinkedIn to somehow um, scale that because it wasn't easy to answer each uh, and every one. And then the uh, second thing was uh, all these uh, uh, consultation calls that I had. Like how about putting all these people together in some place and uh, having them to talk to each other. And this uh, is how I the Data Talks Club, uh, the idea for Data Talks Club appeared. So I thought they, they need a place to, to hang uh, out together. I woke up, I went to GoDaddy, I registered a the domain there. It took, I don't know, 10 minutes. Then I went to MailChimp, 
I set up a landing page. It also took like 10 minutes. And then I put this link to a few places, mostly GitHub. So I put it on my GitHub uh, account. And then uh, when people would reach out to me, I say I would say, here's this community. You can actually not only ask me a question, but also get an answer from others to join it. And then people would uh, like would DM me and then I would reply with that. And B, they would just stumble uh, upon my GitHub and then find a link there and also join. And yeah, and it got some traction. People, like I started talking to people, I started to ask them different questions. Hey, what do you do? Why did you join? What brought you here? Um, and then, yeah, it was going quite well. And then we had the first event, um, which attracted also quite a few people. And then I will also, uh, you probably know Demetrius from MLOps, uh, pod, uh, MLOps community. They have a podcast and I was a guest on his podcast. Nah. And I really liked the format. So the way uh, he invited people and then uh, basically what we are doing right now, right? So we are having an interview, but it's live. So people can join, ask questions, and then it is recorded and released as a podcast. So I really like that format. And uh, yeah, I decided to try something similar. And yeah, this is how it started. You recall, I recall you shared some statistics with me on, right? I think like first month the, the growth was crazy and then the six months, I mean, what happened? Could, could you refresh our memory about how the data tax club community grew? Yeah, I, I don't remember the numbers. So I think, uh... Like the first year, by the end of 2020, um, we had like um, 500 people. Um, wow. By the end of 2021, it was uh, 9,000. So yeah, uh, but mostly like it, what I did the first month, um, I think I, I said to you, I, I told you that I was um, welcoming everyone in the community. I was trying to get to know them. I was trying to ask uh, what brought them uh, here and uh, um, trying to learn what kind of problems they have um, and what people are interested in and what I can do to solve their problems. So this is what I was doing the first month. Uh -huh. um, so welcoming people, trying to understand uh, what kind of problems they have. And then um, that actually doesn't scale well when more people join at some point. I just stopped doing that because like when uh, three, four people join per day, I can do that. But when uh, 10 people or 20 people join per day, that's not possible to to welcome everyone and ask them uh, these questions. And then uh, the first quarter, um, we started events. So a friend of mine, he asked me if I know a place where he can give a talk. And I said, yeah, actually, you know what? There is a place where you can do that. There that is a was... place now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think uh, Eugene, you also attended that event. It was about SageMaker, um, yep. deploying models with SageMaker. Right? It was from Dmitry. Um, that was the first event and like 70 people or something like that uh, joined the first event. I thought, wow, so cool. I should do more of that. Actually, the, the second event was like 20, the third event was like 10. So I think it's just, uh, you know, the excitement of something new. Uh, so that excitement uh, gradually went down and then it, uh, uh, I think around 20 people is uh, the, um, the usual attendance, I would say. So 70 is very, it's more like an outlier. Uh, yeah, so this is when I started actively announcing that we have events, that we have this awesome community. I was uh, creating LinkedIn posts. So before I was like in more in a stealth mode, um, but then this is where we went live. And then in the first uh, six months, so um, we experimented with different activities, like this book of the, the week thing, when we in, invite book authors and ask them questions about their books. Um, so I took this idea from a forum called uh, Called, called Java Ranch. So they used to do something similar. So I thought it would be cool to do um, something like that in Data Talks Lab as well. Then, yeah, we started a podcast. And then at some point, even a conference, uh, we did a small conference. I think you also were a speaker there on that conference one year ago. 
Um, yeah, that attracted quite a few people. I think this is how it started. So after that conference, I think more than 1,000 people joined the community. And then gradually, now by the end of this year, it reached, uh, uh, yeah, 9,000. Almost now 10, it's almost 10. Yeah. Yeah. So I recall, uh, so I, I recall the first time uh, that I really got a shock was when Alexei invited me to share on Data Talks Club, right? Like, okay, what's Data Talks Club about? You learn more about it. And that's when I realized that Alexei was actually putting out two videos or podcasts a week. Uh, that's a lot of work. I mean, on top of a full-time job uh, at OOX, I was wondering, uh, could you share with us, how do you do it? How do you sustain? Were there times that you actually felt like skipping for a week? Yeah, there were times. What helped actually with not skipping is uh, planning in advance. So I would uh, sit right now, for example, and plan one month in advance. And then I would announce this. And once it's announced, it's very hard to skip because already people signed up, they expect me to show up. Uh, and then, of course, there is a guest who comes. Uh, yeah, so th there is no way uh, for skipping after it's announced. So I try to do this like uh, for uh, a month in advance. So that really helps to, uh, to, to sustain that. Um, yeah, and the, the, the way it works, yeah, so I need to reach out to people um, asking, hey, we have this um, great community, we have weekly events, do you want to speak at our event or be a guest to our podcast? Um, only half maybe answer and uh, out of this half, maybe a half say yes. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's not always easy to find speakers. Um, what uh, I found helpful is when I ask somebody for a recommendation, I ask, hey, do you know somebody who can speak at our event? Um, and then when I reach out, I say, uh, person X recommended to reach out to you. And they said that uh, you would be interested in speaking. Well, what do you think about that? And that uh, increases uh, chances of getting a positive answer a lot. Yeah, so with uh, webinars, it's easier. So usually there is not so much preparation on my side. Uh, usually the guest, uh, uh, the, the speaker takes, uh, like it's mostly on them to prepare. So I only need to get like the title, the description, um, so biography, like a, like a picture. So that's not easy. Oh, that's not difficult for me to prepare for that. Um, with podcasts, it's a bit trickier because I actually need to do some research, um, um, put together. So it's, it's usually there is a topic. So first of all, I need to know what kind of things I can ask this person. So then I need to do some research, uh, look at the internet footprint of this person, see what they usually talk about, uh, or ask them, hey, what do you want to talk about? But when I do this, they say, oh, I don't know, what do you want to ask me? And then, yeah, I usually need to do some research and then come together a list of questions. Then I send this doc to a guest. Uh, so then the guest says, okay, yes, I can answer this, this, and this question, but I don't like this question. Let's remove that. So we do like a couple of iterations. And once they are comfortable with the questions, then we make an announcement. So there is um, like uh, some time to prepare in, for podcasts, but I actually enjoy doing that quite a lot. So doing some research and preparing these questions. And then after that, I announced it uh, on a couple of platforms. So we use Eventbrite, Eventbrite, we use uh, Meetup. So I make announce announcements there um, and I use automation tools like Zapier. So it's like uh, the moment I post something on Eventbrite, then it posts a link to Slack, it posts a link to Twitter, it posts a link to LinkedIn, and it really helps me with a lot of routine stuff. So that's, that's helpful. Um, uh, so that's a bit easier for me to manage these things. So that's another reason how I sustain doing this because I rely on tools like Zapier to make my life easier. Um, yeah, I guess that's uh, that's a summary. That's really cool in how you use your ability to, as an engineer, to try to automate stuff and try to make it easier uh, for you. There are talks clubs, there's just a lot of different kind of talks, right? I think I was looking at it, there's open source spotlight, there's minis, um, there's, you know, book of the book of the week. What, what are all these different talks about and what do you hope to achieve from each type of talk? Yeah, so indeed. Um, so 
Let's start with Open Source Spotlight. So Open Source Spotlight is, uh, as name suggests, it gives spotlight to open source projects. Uh, so we invite open source authors to talk about their tools, the tools they are building. Um, so this is something I'm doing more like on the background. I don't think I ever announced that thing that, hey, we're doing this thing. And just one day, a video like that appeared. Mm. It was actually, um, you probably know Neil Lathia because he also interviewed him. Yep. So he is doing a model store. Uh, he, this is like uh, a model store, uh, open source framework for storing your models. So I interviewed him once and I like this format uh, to, of talking to open source authors. Mm, and then I reached out to more and more people with that. Mm. So I, even though I haven't announced, so these videos are published to our YouTube channel. So some people uh, watched it. So what I want to do there is I want to create a page on our website that is called tools. And all these interviews, all these open source tools will end up there on, uh, on Datadocs Club's website. So actually, by the way, we are now I'm working on creating a new design for the, uh, for the website. So this new design will already have this tools page. So that's open source spotlight. Then we have, you mentioned, I think, minis, right? Mm -hmm. So minis is something that uh, when I was on vacation, so I was preparing to go on vacation for one month. And I thought, okay, like it's uh, not a good idea to not have any activity on the YouTube channel or in the community for one month. Uh, so what can I do to actually, to have some activity there, to have people in the community mm, entertained? Um, so yeah, I thought, uh, let me reach out to a few people who are active in the community and ask them about some stuff, some things uh, for 10, 15 minutes. And that was the idea of Minis. So I reached out to a couple of people, we recorded that. And then every week of my vacation, uh, during the time when we usually have a webinar, I would release this video so to keep the channel active. And that was only for one month. I really loved, uh, I really liked the format, but uh, given the amount of other activities I'm doing, it's just difficult to, to also add that. So for now, there are no minis anymore. But yeah, maybe one day we'll come back to that and have more of that. Because I really like the format, then it's small and focused, unlike this one, which is long and not focused. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's great that actually these all these different ideas came out uh just out of necessity right it's not something yeah. that was planned yeah exactly. um, okay last last question about the community before i want to ask you about your book um so what are some of the most popular talks or guests you had and not considering engagement more of your some of your favorites yeah so there are very popular as popular uh, well-known yes so martin Kleppmann, who is um uh, the author of Designing Data Intensive Applications. So he was doing AMA in our Slack community. Um, so probably that was the most famous person we had. And uh, of course, like I put an announcement in Reddit and it had like 100 likes in uh, one hour or something like this. Like people wow. really, like that brought quite a few people to the community. So that was very well received and then uh, like I, after that, I compiled on he, all his answers and also published them as a web page and also generated some, some attention. Then another famous guest, uh, I don't know if he considers himself famous. You probably know him. It's uh, Santiago from, uh, who, is, who has uh, quite a lot of followers on Twitter. Uh, more than yep. uh, 100,000 right now. Um, so I would qualify him as, uh, as famous because that's quite a following that he has on Twitter. So I had him as a guest. Uh, he was talking about his transition from software engineering to machine learning. Then, uh, yeah, another talk that was very well received uh, uh, from Elena, Elena Samuilova. She was talking about how your machine learn learning project would fail. So it was also a talk that she gave during the conference, this conference one year ago. And it got quite a lot of attention, like it has more than 1,000 views. Um, so that was quite uh, a good talk. The talk was good and it also received a lot of, the, a lot of attention. And then you also asked about uh, things that didn't get a lot of engagement, but more like my favorites. 
So there are two talks that I really loved. I really loved uh, these topics and uh, my interview with the guests. And these are the least popular topics, uh, the least popular episodes of uh, the Data Talks Club podcast. I don't know why. They were really good in my opinion. So the first one uh, was about development advocacy for data science from Ellie O'Brien. Uh, L. O'Brien. Yeah, I guess uh, people are not so much into deaf advocacy in the community, but the talk was very nice. And the second uh, least popular talk was from Dimitrius from MLOps community about community building. So I guess it's also kind of off topic for Data Talks Club. Uh, oh, yeah. So these so two good. events, they were quite good. So I really love, I really like the topics. Uh, I really like the, liked the guests, so it was quite an engaging conversation. But yeah, I don't think these two podcast episodes got uh, enough attention. Uh, I suspect that both of these uh, topics are a bit of topic for uh, Data Talks Club. So we're yeah. more like and nice. your audience probably yeah, more data science exactly. practitioners. Exactly, but I really loved uh, them personally because this is something that I'm interested in. Like, uh, for, uh, for example, talking to Demetrius about community building, most of these things that he shared with me, I could apply uh, immediately for Data Talks Club. So that was useful for me personally. Okay, I guess one last question. Uh, and I know we are coming out on time, but one last question before I have a lot of questions to ask you about your book. Uh, I know you've been trying to monetize the community, you know, with the main goal of making the community more self-sufficient. Uh, you know, maybe hiring more people, making it less reliant on you so that you can go on vacation and Data Talks Club can still continue. Uh, could you share how that's going? Uh, how can people support Data Talks Club? Yeah, I, I'm i thinking about the word monetize, if I like it or not, because there is a, a bit of a ne negative sentiment to me about this. Um, I don't know why. Uh, but yeah, the, the idea is to earn some money with the work I'm doing. So mostly for me, I was spending money on the community. Uh, so I actually spent around five, uh, 500 euros per month. On wow, that, on that's a lot. Month. That's, uh, yeah, so that's a lot. I have a good salary, but yeah. That's, that's a couple thousand a year. That's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. Um, so. For me, like I like doing this, uh, but getting some of this money back would be nice. So, and I was thinking, how can I actually um, do that? How can I start earning some money? And uh, then the second thing is, yeah, like you said, uh, I'm, it would be nice to, for me to be able to offload some of the things I'm doing to, uh, to hire somebody to do some of the things. There are a lot of routine and mundane tasks like setting up all these events that could be uh, delegated to somebody if I had money for that. Because I think 500 euros is already quite a lot to spend even more on top of that. Yeah, so for the last six months, I have been talking to uh, different companies and then I was asking them, hey, do you would you like to support the community? Um, and it was... It is very difficult for me. So I'm more like, I consider myself an engineer. Um, so I don't have this, how to say, sales uh, mindset. So for me, it's very difficult to sell. It's, uh, to sell. it's very unnatural to me. So I'm more used to uh, sitting in front of a computer and coding something rather than talking to people and then uh, convincing them to, to give me some money. Like that, was, uh, that is very difficult to me. Yeah, so, so far it wasn't very fruitful. Um, I'm learning a lot, so I'm taking courses about sales. I don't know if they are helpful. Uh, let's see. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I did uh, find a few uh, sponsors. Um, there was one, um, uh, so the one person wanted to advertise an event. So they paid me some money. So they advertised this event through the newsletter and yeah, I don't think people actually engaged with this link at all. So it was oh, no. very few registrations. Uh, so it was uh, super low engagement. The event was actually good. I don't know why. Um, and that person said, OK, yeah, like the it's just not uh, um, how to say like uh, it's not bringing any value. So the, the return on investment is very bad. Uh, 
Well, but he paid me money, so that was already good. Then another one was from Topcoder. So you know this top quarter they host data science competitions as well. So at mm -hmm. the end of uh, like it was uh, less than one month ago, I think. So they also gave me some money to advertise a competition they were hosting. And yeah, they they actually did like the result the results. So the engagement was uh, quite good. Um, so I keep my fingers crossed that they will and they like this and this they will come back for more things like that. Then I also managed to partner um, with Toloka. Toloka is a company uh, similar to uh, Mechanical Turk from Amazon. So they are doing crowdsourcing. And uh, we will organize a workshop. It's actually already announced. It's on our website. Uh, so this is a workshop about uh, using crowdsourcing for monitoring the, model, the performance of your models. So using humans to uh, humans in the loop to see if uh, your model is still doing good, uh, is still performing well, and if it doesn't, then how can we uh, trigger retrain, retrain, for example. So it's about that. I think I think the topic is pretty interesting, so I hope people will also like this and will come, and Toloka will like it, and uh, they will decide to do more events like that with us. So if you are listening for this right now, you can go check our website. There is an event from, I think it's called crowdsourcing for model uh, performance. And you, if you think this is interesting, please sign up because they will look at these numbers. And if the numbers are good, then uh, they will consider to... I'm going to sign up now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I'm, right now I'm in process of talking to a few more companies. Um, I would like to convince them to, to do something like longer term sponsoring, like maybe sponsor for a year. Um, um, yeah, so far I haven't, uh, how salespeople say, closed, right? So nobody signed up yet, nobody signed the contract. But uh, let's see how it goes. Uh, it's actually something entirely new to me. It's way out of my comfort zone. Um, so I'm also learning that. Um, I hope we will see new sponsors soon. Uh, I keep my finger crossed and yeah. So, and uh, yeah, please uh, interact with, engage with uh, content from sponsors if you th think it's valuable because they're looking at these numbers and uh, this is what they um, will use to decide if they want to sponsor more communities or not. Because uh, that will be very helpful for me personally, uh, like for the community, for me personally, to be able to use some of this money to invest back in the community, maybe hire a personal assistant to take care of all these mundane tasks and all that. So if you're a company, if you're working in a company, maybe you can talk to, uh, I don't know, your marketing department and then see if they would be interested in sponsoring and supporting Data Talks Club. And if they would be, maybe you can connect us. That would be super helpful. And that was the best time to uh, we know I like is initially starting in this uh, while looking for sponsors and it's going to be easier you don't really have the queue to have an event um, because he can give his full attention so thank you for sharing us with us about that uh, i like to say about their talks club and you know how much work it was uh, it took a lot of work. Uh, so recently you wrote a book called ml bootcamp well you've been Put in a lot of effort into it and it was recently published late last year uh can you share with us about that book uh what is it about who is it for uh, and why did you write it mm -hmm. yeah i'll try to be brief because there are still uh questions from the community that i want to cover uh yeah so this book yeah. was for people like me for software engineers who want to go to machine learning so and there i focused uh, uh, on teaching through projects and uh, I also focused on being more end-to-end -end rather than just uh, here's how you train your model in Jupyter Notebook and here's, uh, you know, these nice graphs. So what happens after that? So there are uh, three chapters devoted to deployment. Um, the sort of like de deployment with Flask, uh, then deployment with AWS Lambda, deployment with Kubernetes. So these kind of things are there as well. And I think this is one of the things that uh, separates this book from other books. I don't think there are many other books that talk about that. 
And yeah, there is also a course based on the book. It's called Machine Learning Zoom Camp, um, which is free. It's based on the book. Um, it's just in video format and then it's cohort based. Uh, well, it was cohort based, now it's almost over. Um, so if you prefer this kind of content more, you can check it out. Uh, in our Slack, it's course ML Zoom Camp. Um, yeah, basically each chapter there is a, um, like a module in that book, but there are also there is also homework and you're getting some points for uh, doing this homework. Then there are also projects and uh, to get the certificate, you need to finish the projects. So if you don't finish the projects, then you will not get it, uh, a certificate at the end. So I think it's the most important thing is to do these projects. So when you see how others do something, now you have to repeat uh, to do it yourself but not to just follow, but do something on your own. And that's why I uh, make it mandatory for people to pass two projects to get the certificate. So yeah, check it out. So why, why I mean, the course that you release is like 13 lessons over four months. Uh, why do it for free? I mean, what's your motivation behind it? And how much effort did it take to create that course? Oh, that's too much. I wish I was timing myself. I didn't know what I was signing up for when I was uh, when I announced it because it's it's just an insane amount of work. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I always wanted to do a course. I once maybe I should have started with something smaller <laughs> than than that. Yeah, I always wanted to do that and see how uh, how it feels to actually do a course. Uh, yeah, and uh, then there was also another. Um, uh, Motivation is to spread the word uh, about the book um, so because everyone will know that this book exists uh, at least everyone who is taking uh, who has taken the course and then also I wanted to attract more people to the community so it kind of served multiple purposes I really liked uh, the engagement I really liked the outcome even though it was very difficult to record I, re I would re record some things multiple times and I would spend a lot of time editing. I still haven't finished editing the last module about uh, Kubeflow serving, but I really liked the result. I really liked the engagement, the feedback I got from people. Um, so yeah, that went quite well. So maybe for the next course, I'll try to do something less uh, ambitious uh, perhaps, <laughs> but I'm quite satisfied with the outcome and the feedback I'm getting from people is really motivating and inspiring. Well, the projects you've taken on have always been, have always had that quality where it's very, very big, but you managed to tackle it anyway. Uh, Data Talks Club and then the book and then now the course. Well, now we have a couple of questions from the community. Yeah, Lynn asks, what advice would you give to someone starting in this field? Um, and how would they go about finding mentors? Yeah. My advice would be to join a community. And this is what I did. And I think it worked quite well for me. Every time I wanted to start in a new field, I joined the community and it didn't, it wasn't always career related. So as I said, I was into uh, exchanging these um, bootlegs, bootleg videos. Um, yeah, so join a community. And then uh, after you join, don't just sit there and watch what people talk about answer questions, do some research, and then people will think that you're some sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, experienced person who knows everything. They don't have to, to know that uh, maybe you're not. Uh, yeah, that's uh, the number one advice I would give. I guess the, the question from Amruta, have you ever felt like giving up during your data science journey? Uh, what kept you going? What, mo what, what motivation? Yeah, for my data science journey, um, yeah, I don't remember actually having this feeling of giving up entirely. But sometimes I would feel frustrated if I cannot derive a formula or if I wouldn't be able to understand SVM. Now I look back at this and uh, find it funny. Like, why did I spend time on learning about SVMs? Why did I think they are important? Like, I wish somebody um, had told me that, hey, don't waste your time on SVMs. So yeah, sometimes I felt frustrated. I thought uh, I was learning something important, but these things uh, weren't important at the end. Um, but what motivated to keep me going, I guess, was the interest uh, that spark that uh, Andrew Eng uh, uh, created in me. Like when I first watched the, that video, I thought, okay, wow, it's so cool. You can actually use uh, data for these kind of things. 
and it felt like magic to me uh, and being able to do this sort of magic and then seeing the results in action i think this is what motivated me mm. yeah so i still have that motivation maybe less so than um, seven years ago because now some of the things that uh, uh, become routine like you know this parameter tuning and then all this uh, other things that are maybe less exciting but uh, I found out that I really like the engineering component of this and seeing my result in action I think this is what still keeps me going yeah I know what you mean I think initially when we first started it's quite amazing that you can actually use data to predict what's going to happen and now building things with your own hands um, a question from William how do you keep up to date with new tools and advances in the field and at work how do you evaluate new tools and libraries yeah so to answer the first part of the question from william is i do not keep up to date with new tools and advances because it's not possible <laughs> like i remember i would uh, use rss reader um, it was the old reader it's something like google reader but uh, mm -hmm. maybe there are people who still remember the google reader it was awesome um, so there are some RSS readers and I would um, set up a RSS feed from archive to oh see what God. kind of... And then it just like <clears throat> a couple of weeks I understood that uh, it's too much. <laughs> that there is no... it's not humanly possible to look at this amount of information. And then at some point I just... okay, like why do I do this? Like what does it actually bring me? And then I think uh, this... Uh, this understanding, this realization came uh, with a bit of experience, understanding that, uh, you know, sometimes what business needs is not uh, state of the art. So I better look at what other companies are doing, what works for them, and uh, uh, try to stay up to date with that, not with the recent deployments, not with recent uh, advances. Uh, and uh, with tools also, like every day there is a new tool. Like you go on Twitter and then there are tools, uh, some new tools that will solve all your problems. But one month after that, nobody remembers about these tools. So probably it's a good idea when, uh, you know, you see a trend that um, like over multiple months, uh, this tool keeps appearing. People keep talking about this. So actually I want to keep to try Kedro. Do you know Kedro? No. Have you heard about this? So I've heard, I've been hearing about this tool for quite a while now to actually give it a try. Um, so this is uh, like uh, pipe, scikit-learn pipelines, but better. This is how I understood it. So I want to give it a try. But yeah, so I just try to <laughs> not stay up to date. That's uh, uh, that's my answer. And then how I evaluate new tools? <coughs> then I don't. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, but th there are many other problems that we need to solve. Uh, sometimes, you know, these tools appear and then we have these uh, hackathons when we can try to play with these tools and see if it's worth including them in the uh, pipeline. But it's not something I do on a regular basis. So it's not like I try to devote, uh, like I heard this advice, like spend 10% of your time trying to play with new stuff. Uh, maybe this is good advice actually, but I do not follow that because uh, I have too many problems, other problems that I need to solve that are not tool specifics. They're tool specific, they are more focused on like, are we actually building the right thing? Do people care about that? Like, it doesn't matter what kind of tool we use for that, right? Agreed. So, well, besides how you're so busy at work and you don't have time to uh, evaluate these new tools, Rob asks, how are you so productive? Uh, what does your process look like? How do you balance your full-time job at ORX and Data Talks Club and writing a book and doing ML Zoom camp? Do you even sleep? Yeah, sleep is annoying, right? So we have to get it. <laughs> uh, sleep is overrated. No, I'm joking. <laughs> so yeah, like I, I'm maybe I'm good at keeping appearances. So, mm -hmm. but actually, I'm like I like to slack. Like I'm, I like to procrastinate. So I'm keeping things up. Like I keeping things very long before starting doing this. Um, so yeah, my process looks like <laughs> I postpone things till the very last day and then do them um, <laughs> like <laughs> before the, the, the deadline. Uh, so for me, what helps is having these deadlines 
and yeah. having these deadlines public. And if I have that, like with the course, uh, like because every week I had to release something that kept me, you know, um, not procrastinating too much. Uh, so I don't know if it's a secret, but yeah. <laughs> Oh, I, I think uh, that makes sense. It, it's like building in public, right? And then once you have a exactly. date, uh, the p people hold you accountable for it. People are expecting you and you don't want to let people down. And so therefore you deliver. Yeah. But uh, unfortunately, I have to sleep. That's uh, <laughs> haven't found a way around that. All right. So we have a few more questions. Uh, Quinn asks, how do you learn technical subjects? How do you know if you're able to apply it well? And you mentioned that you keep notes about your projects. Could you shed some light on that? Mm -hmm. So learning technical subject is, um, I think, the best way, especially for technical subjects, is to do it through projects. Um, I think you, uh, Eugene, I think you mentioned this uh, concept uh, like, like a year ago, maybe, um, just in time learning. Yeah. So you <laughs> build the project and then there is a thing you need to learn and then you start uh, looking it up and then uh, you solve your problem. Uh, and you learn enough just to solve this problem. So you don't yep. learn entire, you know, machine learning just to solve this uh, classification problem. You just maybe learn logistic regression or whatever. So um, that's uh, that's how I try to learn technical subjects by doing projects and by focusing on these projects. So uh, that helps me focus on that. Um, so how do you know if uh, you can apply it well? Well, that's, uh, I guess, asking for feedback uh, and then uh, like at work that would mean deploying things and then doing A-B tests, uh, things like that. But uh, yeah, like for my personal projects, it's like, am I satisfied with the result? Uh, does it work or does it break apart? Uh, things like this. And then um, about notes is uh, when I try something new, I try to document everything what I do because I know the next day I wake up I will not remember anything from this. And then yeah. sometimes my bash keeps the history. Sometimes I can just go up and see what were the comments, but this is very unreliable. So often when I close my terminal, all the comments that I put are gone. I don't know why it happens, but I do not rely on that. I put I would create like a readme.md file or I would open a Google document or Notion, recently I have been using Notion for that. And I would just copy paste uh, like from the terminal, the comments there. Sometimes I would take screenshots uh, with errors and then would post uh, there. And then, uh, yeah, I shared a couple of tutorials like that. So I had these documents and then I put them together as docs, uh, like tutorials, public tutorials and then shared. Um, yeah, I have a couple of Git, uh, GitHub repos uh, like that, so maybe you can check them. Uh, one more question from the Slack community, and then we go on to the Slido. Um, so Dimitrios, who's a fellow organizer of super communities, I think he organizes ML Ops community. He asks, where do you get your community related ideas from? Yeah, I know where Dimitrios is coming from <laughs> with, with this. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, I did get a few ideas, let's say, I got inspired from the stuff Demetrius is doing, or was doing at the MLOps community. So for example, the podcast, the format we have right now uh, of doing it live with the live audience. So today, I think this is the first time when it didn't really work well because of the internet problems. So the first time in more than a year. So I think that, uh, uh, yeah, I hope it doesn't repeat uh, on Friday when we have another one. But yeah, <laughs> so this idea, I borrowed from uh, Demetrius. Then there are some ideas, uh, like for example, from Java Ranch, which is a Java community. So they invited book authors to ask them questions. So I also borrowed this idea. So I got a lot of inspiration from other communities um, and perhaps also added uh, a personal twist to these ideas. For example, the minis and the open source spotlight. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, but mostly it comes from uh, some, uh, from other communities like MLOps community um, and uh, from people, from the community members. Sometimes people would reach out to me saying, hey, I have this awesome idea. Do you want to try it? And then usually, yes, uh, let's try it. And then there were a few, a few initiatives like that that uh, fortunately didn't work out well. So for example, about networking sessions, um, but somebody reached out to me saying, hey, it would be nice to just uh, 
hang out in Zoom and then we started, we tried that, it didn't work out, but yeah, this is how these things happen. Right, I think we have the last question for this podcast, which is from Slido. Have you ever considered live coding sessions or coding and commenting sessions? Mm, yeah, that would be interesting. Not for Data Talks Club, I haven't, we haven't really tried that. Um, for, yeah, for ML Zoom Camp, actually, there were a few office hour sessions when it was live coding. So maybe check it out. Um, but not as a something, um, uh, like something that we regularly do. That would be a good idea to try something like this. So yeah, thanks for the idea. Um, but uh, we are already doing a bit of that. So check out our machine learning Zoom Camp uh, uh, office hours. All right, so that's it for all the questions. Is there anything else that you felt that I didn't ask, but you really wanted to share with uh, the audience? No, I think I just want to thank everyone who have been with me all this time, uh, who joined at the beginning, who joined uh, half a year ago, who just joined this community. Uh, so you kept me motivating, uh, seeing the community growing is awesome. This is a really good feeling. So thanks for being a part of that. And I'm looking forward to the next, to this year to do even more of that. So I hope I stay sane and find sponsors and uh, delegate some of this work. But I'm, I'm really excited about this year. So thanks for being a part of that. Thank you to everyone who's out there listening. And maybe next year we'll have another, you know, a review of how, how it went this year and we'll do the same format. All right. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. And thank you, Eugene, for Bye. interviewing me. Likewise. Uh, my pleasure. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye.